Hi guys, this is Michael Merdad, and this is our Friday Night Spiritual Insights with Michael Merdad presentation. So thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about relationships. Should I stay or should I go? <laughs> In a nutshell, the answer is, I don't know. Because there is no answer, should I stay or should I go? Some people could say, um, well, just tell me the right answer. They're looking for a psychic to tell them, should I stay or should I go? Yes, go. Yes, stay. That's not actually a good thing um, to ask for. It's not, not a problem to ask for second opinions or extra feedback or insights around it. But just simply somebody else making up your mind for you could be dangerous. Most of the time, you know, I think it could be dangerous. But I understand that you reach out, you know. Um, when people call me and ask me for, should I stay or should I go, we really look at all the material there. You know, we don't just, my sensors are telling me to stay or, you know, I don't just tell them like that. So, but I am saying that there's no answer. Some of you then can say, well, you, what you mean is the answer is within us. No, I'm saying that there's no single answer because such a multi-layered question with definitely multi-layered issues behind it can't be defined as a yes or no. You can't write in a book, Here's the absolute moment when you should stay or go because uh, one couple with exactly the same issues as another couple and this issue, this couple has one year of history and this one has 50 years could make a big difference. The age of the couple, having children together or not could, could influence it. Having financial, um, you know, uh, um, enmeshment could affect it. The health of a person or both people could affect it. Um, all kinds of pieces to it. So there's actually no linear answer because it's by far, you know, far, far away from being a linear question. But we're going to at least hone in on it a little bit. Now, again, some of, somebody could be watching saying, oh, this is about partnerships, so I guess it's not for me. Guys, this is relationships of any type, including the one with your job or with your car. Should I keep the car or should I let it go? Just like a partnership. You're going to think that sounds strange because the relationship is so much different. No, actually, our relationships with our environment, our relationships with the world, it's all relevant. It all reflects our relationship within, with all things. So my relationships with the outside world, with any person, place, or thing, whatever, even my certain environments or certain topographies I like and don't like, I'm having a relationship with them. If the place I live, I don't like it, it's too icy and cold, I'm having a relationship with it. And it really does make a difference. It'll wear me down prematurely, just like a relationship with a person would. So really, it, it can go all kinds of different directions. And at the end of the day, you've probably heard me say many times, if you watch programs of mine, there are three relationships you can have. It's with God, yourself, and others. And the priority is in that direction, in that order. My relationship with God is foremost. Now, I'm not talking about a, a certain type of worship or religion. I'm talking about my having a belief in and a connection to the source of all life. And it doesn't matter if you approach that as a, as a pagan or as a Catholic or as a Buddhist or whatever it happens to be. Just to understand that there is a consciousness and having a relationship with it. It's kind of nice to personalize that relationship, but that can go too far. Buddhism is really trying to counter how that went too far and say, don't even personalize it. Don't, don't, just don't do it. That's, so they're against personalizing a relationship with God. Jesus, on the other hand, says, call it Father, Abba. You know, like make it so close that it's like a, a person that parented you or a person that helped create you. So Jesus is personalizing it, but he's not intenting it to be personalized the way some do, where there's a power literally up in the sky, somewhere just beyond the clouds, um, that's looking down on us. It's an old man with a beard and sandals and all that. So uh, by all means, the greatest minds know not to overly personalize it, but don't detach from it either. Make it something that in your own way you can understand. So it's okay to personalize if you understand what it means to do so in a healthy way. 
You're connecting with the divine. You're connecting with love. There's actually something, and it's even a stretch to call it a thing, something that created me and is all powerful and loves me, is aware of me struggling and trying to bid me to come home to get away from the struggle. If coming home means the Buddhist meditation uh, types of techniques and compassion, so be it. If it means techniques of A Course in Miracles, love and forgiveness, so be it. But some form of coming back, not only to God, it's also coming back to who I really am. So the whole, all of the universe, the real universe, the light behind the objects like planets, you know, the real universe is actually a wave of consciousness that reaches out to embrace us and pull us home. It's fantastic, really beautiful. But do you have a relationship with that? Do you at all commune with it? And so doing so is your first relationship. If you have this detachment or agnostic or intellectual or atheistic standpoint to it all, it just creates greater distance from love, which means you're going to be more fully uh, conflicted inside because you're lacking love. Real, true love. Even if you think you fully have love with your partner or your children or things around you, your animals, it's all it is is an, another, it's a synthetic form of love. I'm glad you have at least something, but it's a synthetic form of love. And so if, if I'm feeling angst or anxious in my partnerships, I must ask myself, or in any relationship with anything, I must ask myself, do I feel nicely tethered to spirit. If not, that could be contributing to today's problems. Talking about whether I should stay or go is worthless because if the causation is deep inside my relationship with God, I might want to work on that first and it might then give me the strength and clarity to work on my partnership of today, the external relationship of today. Furthermore, it, if, if, if it was the causation behind it, then healing the one brings a healing to the other. But even if it wasn't the causation, it doesn't hurt for me to connect anyway, uh, more tightly. And even if it wasn't, though, my connection to spirit, it will still improve my situation where I am. So that's for starters. My second relationship, there's God, self, and others. Others are the outermost scenario, it, whether that's, again, job, car, person. That's the outermost. So God first, let me get make sure I'm feeling kind of tethered. And so in some ways, what, what that means for me is just to set aside the dramas of the outside if possible, if possible, and drop into a, a deeper sense of surrender. I'm not sure what you'd have me do, what you'd have me say, so guide me. Guide me to a place of peace and help me to bring everybody else there with me, if possible. So then the second relationship, self. And in my relationship with myself, I'm looking for what's happening for me, what's being triggered. Well, it's them, they, 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 they. That's not a relationship with yourself. If you're saying you, they, them, it, you know, conspiratorial kinds of uh, consciousness, you sound paranoid, by the way, when it's a they, 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 shadows, you know. My contribution, even if you think it's they did something, why, why am I reacting to it? Why am I triggered? How am I triggered? Am I too loud? Am I too soft? Am I shutting down? Am I detaching? Am I running? Fight, flight, freeze. What am I doing and why? Get to know yourself. And there's more on that in other talks, God, self, and others, okay? And in my book, Creating Fulfilling Relationships, I go into that in good detail, into all these relationships in good detail. But the third, let's get to that. The third relationship with others. See, I can't just jump to talk about others without explaining the first and second relationship because these affect that one. They really do. Having this together strengthens our ability to be in any relationship with anything or anyone. So we can't neglect the inner work, the inner consciousness, the inner relationships uh, on behalf of just talking about outside stuff. Now, let's talk about the outside. So I'm having a relationship, and as I said, it could be with anything, but let's go ahead and get to the point of, let's just say it's with a person or persons. It's building, and again, it could be a job, but I'm not, I haven't been happy there for a while, my job. I haven't been happy there for a while, my partnership. 
And so many people write in around this, man, because they're like, uh, sometimes it's just heavy conflict all the time. But some of you guys are like, well, I love my this person. I've been with him for many years, but we're just not connecting anymore. Well, guys, there's a few things you can do to kind of cut to the chase. Instead of, I definitely don't advise remaining ambiguous, remaining kind of confused or foggy headed about it, nor numb. Well, I'm just going to stay here with, you know, uh, a dazed look in my eyes. And yep, yeah, here's 45th year now and 82nd year of our relationship or whatever. I don't recommend that. That's called living hell. You know, it is. It's like we're the living dead and we're just going through motions. And I just don't recommend that. So what I'm recommending, unfortunately, then is really a more difficult thing, which is, you know, calling it. The, the emperor is naked. There's a problem. No, there's no problem. Be quiet. Let's just, you know, let's just be in love and not talk about that sort of thing. But we're not. We're just sort of housemates. We're just sort of co-parents sometimes. You know, we're almost just friends sometimes. It's like we're business partners or whatever, you know, and that's not, that's not alive. And some people say, you know, well, Michael, you just have to get past that because that's just life. Everybody, it always gets old and gets tiring for everybody. Uh, yeah, that's true. That doesn't make it tr right. You know, it doesn't make it the healthy version. So I can say to you that it's important for us to call something as it is. You know, look, we're, we're kind of drifting apart or we're kind of numb or, you know, sweetheart, I think we got together as friends and then stayed together for whatever reasons, you know, gratuitously or because of shames or guilt or whatever. Um, sometimes, guys, we've gotten together as friends. Sometimes we did it to get away from our other partner. Sometimes we get, did it to compensate for something else. Sometimes we did it to get away from our parents. All kinds of reasons, and it doesn't make for the right reasons. And then we feel kind of guilty or ashamed or whatever else it is. Many things, you know, it's obvious um, the kinds of things it could be. And then we're just, we just, so we just try to ignore it and just bear with it. You know, I've seen so many people over the years and um, they can have a negative relationship and they'll stay on behalf of some illusion or another. And sometimes the most challenging relationships is when we don't have enough reason to stay nor enough reason to go. Those are a challenge because we're just sort of flatlined. Not quite, you know, not quite enough. There's just, it's like a numb experience. Sometimes it's a little better than numb. So there's a little life showing. We don't want to pull the plug because they, they look like they might be alive. But there's not a definite sign that they're alive. So it's really a challenging thing. You know, somebody's in a coma. Are they really there or not? Are they one of those people that... They, they may come back to life two seconds after we pull the plug and we blew it. They could have come back to life. No, we'll just let them stay on respirators. We'll let them stay on life, you know, equipment, um, lifelines of whatever form, just in case. You know, and, and like, you know, 80 years later, we're still waiting around. Um, it's That's why I said it's there's no answer per se, because... That person, they might change any day now, so I don't want to walk away from them. Or they may not change, so I want to walk away, but I'm stuck in the middle. There's not an easy answer to that because the whole point is you are stuck. You are in the middle. So sometimes you have to just say, wait a minute, I'm just going to stir this up a little bit. I'm going to shake it up and say, what's going on? Um, is there life left or isn't there? How do I do that? Probably not repeating the same things I've tried in the past to get something to happen. You know, so the let's what we need is spicing up our relationship. That'll bring it back, you know. And so you, you read those stupid magazines at the checkout stands that tell you, you know, here's the way to bring back your relationship. They don't know a damn thing about relationships. Come on. I mean, not a damn thing about them. So they tell you ridiculous things that people are paid to make up, you know, hey, uh, hey, 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 Joyce, we want you to write an article on uh, 
um, how to spice up relationships, and they're on staff editors very often. Uh, get an article written, we'll put it in this issue because we're going to be selling spicy perfumes. So we'll have an article on spicy relations, spicing up relationships and how to spice up perfumes. And so they try to tie these things together. They're trying to tell you what you're supposed to be thinking and then sell you something to fix or counter or whatever that particular thing they talked you into thinking or feeling. So these magazines, they'll say, you know, spice up your relationship. Dress up in a French maid outfit. And that's just for the guys. No, <laughs> you know, but dress up in a French maid. Do this. Go out spontaneous. Uh, uh, have a planned date night. God, I mean, I, I just don't even understand some of the ridiculousness of some of these things. Um, but, but I do understand it's what some people feel they need. And it probably has helped some relationships out there somewhere. I would, though, say that it probably only helps them temporarily because you spiced it up. You brought in a third party, a little sexy, you know, and now we have a little threesome going, a little fun, sexiness, um, spicing up a relationship, you know, uh, having a, a third person or a little buzz, you know, bring in a little drugs, alcohol, a little stimulants, um, or like I said, date nights, or there's all these just glorious, fun things. I just don't think they're real enough that they last because they're not changing the heart and soul of the people, you know? And when you don't change things and there's a stagnation, usually something more tragic is gonna happen because human beings have souls and the souls are far more conscious than the humans are. And the souls know you guys are living a lie. If you don't wake up, we're going to do something to wake you up. We're going to have to shake you up. And then we act like victims when it happens. So to me, being conscious, having communication and conversations is essential. If you have a partner, think about this very clearly and simply. If you have a partner, again, it could even be a job or anything else, and the people involved, like your boss or your coworkers or your partner or whatever, do not want to communicate. They do not want to acknowledge there's a problem. Even if they acknowledge it, they don't want to do anything about it. They're like, well, there's nothing we can do. We don't have money to get raises. We don't have this to do that. Um, or your partner who says, I'm happy with the way things have been. You know, um, if there's not going to be communication, I personally think that already is the beginning of the end. If there's not going to be communication, I already start having to line some things up like some... Uh, uh, exit strategies. That's what I was also meaning by you have to stir the situation. You have to stir things up, shake things up. Um, they say in, uh, you know, when you're studying CPR and so forth, one of the first things you do when you see somebody looks like they're passed out or dead or something like that, you know, you shake them. Can you hear me? You, you try to startle them in case they're sleeping or in case they're just resuscitatable you know there there there's still something there that you can grab hold and pull them back to life um for whatever reason you know it might have been and if they're choking you even boom you know you can do like even a heimlich maneuver to get something but you do something seemingly drastic to shake something up even if it's shaking up the you know the windpipe or whatever trying to get them to breathe by boom you know a nice firm grip in the solar plexus well very similar um, it's very similar to relationships. And I don't mean do something hurtful, dramatic. I'm just saying shake things up. Um, so it's let's communicate. It's let's talk to a couple's counselor. It's um, do you want to do some spiritual work with me? It's um, why, you know, conversations like why are we together and what do you feel? And, you know, don't challenge in a negative way. You never go to work on a relationship. You don't enter a relationship conversation like we need to talk. It, it already has this ominous negative feeling. You know, it's like, um, you know, I don't know if I've told you lately the things I've really most enjoyed about a relationship over the years. See, that sounds kind of positive. It brings their, like, their attention like, oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, God, remember? God, that one time we did this and Remember that, God, that's just cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you know, okay. So they're going to be mostly listening. And um, then you can add, you know, do you want to do more things like that? See, that's 
a positive inviting. Would you like to do more of that? Well, you know, I guess. And then you might now have a conversation that's merging into something. They might also say, no, that was fun then, but I don't want to do anything more. Then you might have to go a little further out. Well, God, I would really love to, though. No, not really interested. But if we don't, then we're kind of going to just be like, you know how my parents were, you know, throw in little funny lines like that. You know how my parents were, oh my God, I don't want to be like them. You know, and well, me neither, but I'm, I'm kind of happy with things are, or the way things are. Um, then you got to go a little further. Well, I guess I'm saying that I'm so intrigued and excited about doing something like that with you. But if you're not interested, I don't know what else to do to really bring some really fun things into our life. Well, why do you need that? Are we fine as we are? Well, yeah, we are, which isn't true, but you can be nice and say, well, we are, we're okay, you know, I, I can see that. But I can also see that there's something in me, I don't know, maybe it's midlife or something, but there's something in me that I just love you and I just would like to have fun and do things, you know? And, and you're hinting and you're hinting and then a little clearer and a little clearer and more obvious and more obvious. Yes, it might get to the point and it would take me a while to have to get this far because um, I'm going to be tactful, but I'm going to get to the point. I'll tell you what, what I'm saying though is if we don't change something, then it's going to be the same and the same isn't working for me anymore. Therefore, that means without the change, there won't be a relationship. You know, I would not enter a relationship with launching that bomb. You know, it's going to be more like build it and build it and build it. And then you might have to say something more blunt, uh, direct. So just think about that. Communication is going to be a very big piece to, to determine whether I should stay or go. You, you're not going to be able to just say, um, if I just ask somebody's opinion, then I'll act on it. Because if you called me and, you know, I do private sessions, intuitive readings and emotional healing and all this on the phone or in person, and you call me and you say, you know, uh, just tell me uh, yes or no. Guys, if I were to say you should absolutely leave and you're not feeling it in your heart and soul that you're clear you're going to go, it's too easy to then blame your psychic, your friend, your who advised you or whatever. Um, it's just too easy and convenient because then you're not an integrate. You're not making an integrated, informed decision. You just got told by somebody to do it, and then you acted rashly on that, uh, which might work. It might not. But you don't want to leave room for you to say, you know, I might have stayed had I not listened to the other other person. It needs to be. I was very clear. I went in there with homework given to me by someone. I launched the homework into activity. The answers were no, 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 no. So I'm clear that that was my answer. Um, they said no. That was my answer. The challenge is going to be when there's not really enough reason to go and you kind of do get along and they're nice and they do listen to you and they are open to working things out, but there's there's not attraction, spicy love, and these kinds of things. Um, it, that's really, that's really challenging. And you, you can't just, you should not just make yourself, well, I married them, I guess I just got to do it. Just got to go through it like it's okay, because they're definitely nice, you know, we don't connect spiritually, but they haven't done anything horrible to me. Besides, I mean, this one next door neighbor beat their partner. This other one cheated 50 times on their partner. I don't have any of that. I should be lucky with what I have. And you'll have some friends telling you that. Um, that's a tough one, man. And I would say, again, what I would recommend, mind you, is an exit strategy such as this. First, communication, love. Friendship, laughter, you know, reminiscing on great things and recognizing we don't have a bad situation. I think that's a healthy thing to acknowledge. It empowers both to realize we've not done horrible. We've done pretty well. There's just something that's not quite here. What I would tell you is a lot of times that's a couple that was actually meant to be friends and they interpreted it more. They launched in, stayed a while and realized, oops, 
and they don't they wonder where the romance went the romance was never there and this might apply to you guys come on it might have never been there it might have been you were friends and tried to or did inadvertently interpret it as a romance so that might be um, the case for you other times there's actually past life kinds of callings other time it's chemical chemistry in our being we feel uh, called and attracted to somebody it's a chemistry um, and it passes the chemistry the hormones shift and then the chemistry that was there inciting this kind of decision now is exited from it but there's also even past life connect, uh, connections or scenarios like um, I really feel a resonance with this a calling a draw to them we get involved but what happens with those of you who believe in lifetimes what happens with lifetimes is they cycle in in parts so if i have a relay if i have a lifetime where i had a relationship let's say of uh, um just living very carefree and, and and sexually wild you know and i did that in one lifetime and yet what if i had another lifetime where i was a celibate now in this lifetime, one of those could cycle in, and they could even both cycle in at the same time, almost like loops that go like this, and they cycle in, but they will cycle out. Well, when they cycle in, when one or the other or both cycle in, it'll be a phase in my life when I'm feeling called to be all stimulus-oriented and partying and you know a little drink and sex and whatever, and then over here, I might be called to a period of, you know, I'm just not sure, I'm backing off, or living conflicted i want to be so sexually alive and yet i'm kind of withdrawn sexually that, that could happen but those are actually compulsions from other lifetimes lived out here but they happen in cycles so what i'm saying is that sometimes you meet somebody to kind of clear up an old pattern and it could have involved let's say uh let's say for example in another lifetime i was given away in marriage, an, a, an arranged marriage, a prince to a princess in some other life, and we're put together. And um, it's something that's arranged so it's not really that deep or heartfelt. Now, this next lifetime or some other lifetime today, I meet you and I feel this, wow, I wanna, I'm attracted, I want to marry you. And we get together and marry and didn't know all we were doing was living out our remembrance, our memory, our feeling of having been arranged as a marriage when in fact this lifetime i'm supposed to be learning to say no arranged marriage is only real love and unfortunately you're on the receiving end of that lesson for me so i'm sitting here arranged a marriage meaning we stepped into it we went through it we're in it now we don't know how to get out because we don't even know how we got in we just we're attracted now. What humans do is fault finding to find ways to get out of the relationship, you know, because they don't know how to just take responsibility and go, God, you know what this was? This was some past life thing and it's kind of cycled to a close. And unfortunately, I dragged someone else into it. It could even be the person I did this range thing in another lifetime because obviously it likely is or usually is. But the point is, I'm ready to end that cycle. Someone needs to at some point. Because if we don't, and we stay married based on a compulsion of another lifetime to be married then, and we're doing it now based on that, we actually didn't learn our lesson and we might have to do this again. Well, you know, not for me. I'd rather get it. And so to maturely be able to say, you know, God, I love you. You're such a sweet person. And I had a certain love for you in the other lifetime too, I'm sure. But it was not a romantic partnership. It was an arranged thing. And, um, you know, it takes quite, quite an evolved soul to be able to own that sort of thing because there's so much, so many pieces to it. You know, I feel bad for you. I feel bad for myself. I feel angry at myself for not seeing it. All kinds of pieces. And all that's going to get in the way of our just being able to be responsible, see it, and walk through it. So should I stay or should I go? Um, if it's coming from past compulsions, I want to look at that. If if we're not really, if we were friends and not lover partners, um, kind of a bummer. You can have an exciting, stimulating relationship that has no friendship. So the stimulus will wear off and you'll go, well, yeah, this was a real blast. What, two, three years? We were doing each other every day, five times a day sometimes. And I'm sorry, what's your middle name? 
Didn't know that. What's your greatest fear in life? I didn't know that either. You know, there was no friendship. There was no development of love, real love, real respect for the other person. What's your greatest fear? What's your greatest dream? Oh, wow. You know, I never thought, it never occurred to me when we were screwing all the time. It never occurred to me to ask anything about you. Um, first of all, all the times we were doing that, did you want to? Or were you going along with it, you know? Um, never realized we were always stoned when we did it. Wow, maybe we should look at that, you know? Deepening the relationship. So you might have a highly stimulating but no depth relationship. You can have a loving partnership, like friendship, but no stimulus. And um, there's so many pieces to this. Should I stay or should I go? How are you going to answer that knowing there's all these pieces? you got to step into the program. you got to step into your homework and go, go for it. you got to get in and do the work. And I mean the work, not a particular program, but just you got to get in and do the work. Um, counselors can help. Um, practitioners of some traditions. Chaplains of other traditions. Sometimes they just pray with you and so on. But it doesn't hurt, you know, to gain clarity. They may not choose to always be counselors, but those that are would be helpful, but only if they're helpful. There's some that are just horrible. You go to some ministers of some traditions and you say, I don't know what to do in my partnership. This is, I'm almost suicidal over the fact that the anxiety, I can't even sleep nights because this horrible situation, I love the person, but we're just done and we, it won't work out. Even if you say the person smacks me and cheats on me, there are some traditions, I swear, where the ministers, because they're part of a tradition, they'll say, I'm sorry, you just have to pray. You have to forgive them because our tradition says that divorces are immoral and naughty, naughty, naughty. And, and they'll just tell you the worst things, the worst advice, just to accommodate their ridiculous dogmas. And I just think it's lame. I think it's lame when moms tell their daughters to stay in a relationship that's abusive or destructive um, because we don't want uh, to, to give a bad impression. You know, what would grandma think, you know? And it's all ridiculous. It's absolutely stupid. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's just beyond the ignorance of ignorant, you know? So I would just say no. Get used to the idea. If you see yourself staying, should I stay or should I go, and your part of staying is rooted in other people and their opinions of what they'll think, I, I wouldn't say jump out of it just on, on behalf of that, but I would say you need to get rid of your need to weigh in their opinions so that you can get clearer to make your own opinion. And again, as I'm coming towards a close, it's learning more and more to see clearly. Um, no past life compulsions, seeing are we were we supposed to be just friends, being able to almost laugh at that, you know, a little bit like, oh my gosh, you know, instead of feeling a heavy shame or guilt around it. No, we, we, I think it's great that we were friends. I think it's beautiful that we were so close as friends that, you know, this and that. And yes, we did kind of interpret it more romantically, you know, golly, you know, just kind of look at it more lightly and not heavy and blame and shame. It's like, wow, missed that one, didn't we? Um, but I'm still glad I was with you, and I still appreciate that we had a very loving, respectful experience, or I'm glad we had children, or whatever. Positive, 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 but not making the positives into compulsions that force you to do something that doesn't feel right. You simply say, yes, positive, and now we need to talk about what we're going to do about it. There's also relationships, the argumentativeness, addictions, other reasons that are more overtly tempting you to leave the situation. Um, there's things like your uh, menopause. There's things that really can affect a relationship. There's things like an illness that can affect. A person, um, breast cancer might affect some people's minds and hearts and intimacy um, experiences because all these things are tests, you know, uh, tests um, to really expose ego because if I loved you because of your breasts and you had your breasts removed and I decide I don't love you, boy, it's just telling. I'm not saying you're a bad person if that's something that triggers you, but I am saying that it's it's really a test to see, you know, like the song, how deep is your love, you know, how real is your love? And it's like, well, yeah, the love was there, but just happened to disappear when you had your breasts removed. Well, that can't be real. That can't be true. 
Um, doesn't make me a bad person if that's how shallow I am, but it does make me a shallow person. So I might want to work on that. You know, do I stay or go? There's more uh, criteria to consider. First of all, if there's too much water under the bridge, Michael, no matter how much we talk, we can have tearful exchanges, hugs. God, I love you so much to that person. And yet we just, we can't get it back. Um, we just can't. It just can't seem to re, re nurture any level of intimacy or stimulation or excitement with each other. We just cry and say, yeah, I'm sorry that happened. Me too. But, you know, I can't help that it's not there or what you did. It went too far, you know. Um, it just woke me up, shook me up, and I can't, I tried and I can't get past it. So that happens sometimes, guys. Too much water under the bridge. I, I think that people should own it. How do you know if it's there? Well, because if there's too much water under the bridge, if you keep reliving in feeling or in action or in thought a traumatic experience that won't let you bounce back, um, then I think you should own it. You, you see that it's happening all the time, and then, so you're not bouncing back. So what you're really saying, if you don't leave, is, but I'm wishing it would come back. Yet you're saying, but it is not and it will not. But my staying is just simply a demonstration of, golly, I, I wish it would, which is a complete waste of time. You, it, you're better off saying, I can see it. The love is gone. I just can't get it back. You know, that's another song, by the way. Um, song lyric. So then um, there's also, uh, um, we say too much water under the bridge. You know, there's also where there's more harm than good. I'm staying there. I'm hoping, wishing, feeling that their addiction will pass. When it does, God, we're gonna, we, we are so in love with each other, but they can't get past their addiction. I would again say, well, stir it up. Tell you what we're going to have to do. I mean, it's a drag that we're in this position, but I'm going to have to end it because you're going to go in recovery. And then maybe a year from now, if you're completely clean and sober, let's talk again to see if there's anything we can do. Um, is that easy? No. But if you don't, you're going to be living hell. So um, stay and in the living hell for the rest of your life if you want. But I'm trying to just help give, give clarity, should I stay or go? Um, that question would imply that you would like some direction. And I'm saying to you, when the too much water under the bridge or when there's more harm than good, including physical violence and things like that, or abuse of your children. It's, it, yeah, it's done. When there's more harm than good, and there's a more subtle version of it when there's more harm than good. If I'm feeling on a zero to 10 scale, this relationship is a six, that's not great, but there's more good than harm. A seven is better, an eight better, nine. Those are stays. A one, there's more harm than good a two, a three, or even a four. There's more harm than good. You, you can just tell. So if my relationship is a three, I'm going to stir things up and see what I can get happening. I'm going to I'm gonna practice some new things. I'm going to learn some, some sexual things, or I'm going to learn better communication skills, or I'm going to learn to be stronger and courageous and to share my feelings and responsibly. I'm going to suggest we go to a counselor. I'm going to do all the things that couples often do, but all of them, not one. I'm going to hit it from all sides and try to awaken, including internal work like prayer and so forth and forgiveness. I'm going to shake things up because if I know that I've brought out all the tools and launched all you know that I could into the situation and it still doesn't happen like some sci-fi movie, you know, so here's our planet. Here comes the asteroid like in these movies. Well, they send out these rockets and try to launch you know, nuclear bombs against the thing to steer away its trajectory, but it doesn't. And there's a very simple math to this. If an asteroid is a trillion miles away, but its trajectory is coming to the Earth, guys, a sneeze would be enough to move it because it's so far away that a, the slightest, I mean like, a fraction of a 32nd of an inch, a fraction of a 64th of an inch, and it's not going to hit the earth if it's far enough away. 
once it gets close, nothing will stop it. There is no trajectory change because it's already bearing down on us and you can feel the winds of it. So in a relationship, if you catch it in time, little changes like, I'm sorry about what I said, me too, I love you. Those things can make a bearing. But if they um, go too far, nothing's going to fix it. Nothing's going to change it. So as we're you know, wrapping things up here, you have to just recognize, where are you in your situation? Just because you say, I'm going to incite some sort of change, doesn't make you the bad guy. It doesn't make you a failure. But it does mean if there's a lot of problems, more harm than good, too much water under the bridge, etc., cetera, et cetera, and partner doesn't want to talk, they don't want to communicate, they don't want counseling, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Guys, the asteroid's getting closer and closer, and you're still wondering, if it's, should I stay or should I go? Um, yeah, there's, you know, I know there's other pieces for you. I know there's um, financial pieces, uh, but they're the breadwinner and it would really mess me up. I have no money to, I know, and I'm sorry about that. And uh, I would not be the one to say, well, you just need to leave and the universe will take care of you. And um, I know all those wonderful affirmation statements, um, but I'm also sympathetic to your fear. So I'm not gonna just tell you, jump out of there. I would though say, look into an exit strategy anyway, even if it's in the quiet recesses of your mind. Can't afford it now, but I'm gonna start putting away some money and prepare for my day. You know, I'm not unlike the, the prisoner in, you know, in a prison who's planning their exit, you know, whether it's a prison camp in a war or a prison, you know, your planning usually is over a period of time. You're watching and listening to each thing you need to learn uh, to make your escape possible. And sometimes that's the way a relationship is. So I hope this has been making sense. And I really pray that it speaks to you in a very practical form. Because again, if you don't do anything, what is the likelihood of anything changing? Pretty close to zero. Pretty close to zero. Change a little bit, you have a chance of minor changes. Create greater changes. Hit it from all sides. Do everything you can. And it's not always easy. And like I said, the tough ones are the ones that are so-so. You know, it's a five or a six. Um, you think, well, I can live with that. Uh, I, so you'll have a five or six, and you can live with that. It's not terrible, but it's kind of flat. And that's what you'll have. If you're okay with that, then power to you. If you're not okay with that, then why are you complaining about it? Let's do something. And everybody has a different number that right that is right for them. The obvious thing is, Anybody with even a kernel of a brain would say five is the bottom. You don't want to go below five because that starts to get into the minus because five is the middle, you know, kind of the flat. Go below that and you're living death. Five is flat and that's kind of the bottom. Don't wait and say, well, I'll wait till it's a one to call it bottom. Five is really for everybody, for the, any average person, kind of what should be the bottom. I'm not saying that if it's a four, you should give up. I said, what can we do to get it up? higher to five and then higher. But I am saying that if I can't get it to change, five would not be enough for me. And one of the downsides is, for some of us is some of us are like, um, I mean, I won't tolerate below a, an eight, let's say. Um, I, for one, whether it's work or relationship or um, team members in my promotions, whatever it is, you know, I'm I'm not the type that's easily going to get by and just be okay with a six. And, and that's a drag for some people around me because they're going to be like, well, why is it a big deal? Let's just continue like this, whether it's my life touring, whether it's a book I'm writing. or I'm never going to be able to just say a six isn't a five, certainly not six or, or even a seven, but seven's probably it. So everybody's the, the, the lowest anybody should settle is a five. But some of us would say six and some of us would say seven. I wouldn't say below a five is any way okay. But for some of us, it's a little higher standard. You know, I want my job, my workplace to be a seven. I want my partnerships to be a seven or whatever it is. My child raising, I want it to be a seven. I don't want it to be like, well, it's pretty terrible, but at least we're a five. I mean, do something, change something, get in there. It's courage, man. Don't settle for racism, sexism, or 
you know, the living death of any form. Um, do what you can to make a change. Never do it with hatred. Never do it with threats per se. But certainly do it with a conviction that, hey, you know, I love this and I'd like to take it higher. Others have the right to say no thanks and then you have to decide. Can a seven be married to a five? Can a five be partnered with a two? You have to decide that. For me, it's not a chance. Um, but you have to decide. If I want my workplace to be a nine, a seven's not going to work. It's maybe bearable for a little while, but at some point, all forms in this universe, all forms of incongruence becomes conflicted energy, conflicted. And that's going to cause an accident at the job that was incongruent. I want a 10 and it's a five. That's going to create an accident. It's an accident waiting to happen. My partnership, I want it to be an eight, but they won't talk to me. They won't communicate. They won't this, that, the other. It's going to be, it's an accident waiting to happen. So somebody's going to start to have a second life, you know, uh, whatever, you know, um, well, you know, just a, a secret life where they have a wife and children elsewhere because this wife didn't want to have babies. So they have babies with somebody else and the secret life or uh, whatever, the job place, you're dreaming of being in another job when in fact, you know, the one you have, you don't lo love enough. So how about just getting a job that you do love enough and and a partnership? If you have a, um, a, a monogamous partnership, let it be a thriving monogamous partner. If you have a, a non-committed partnership of some kind, let it be great. If you're polyamorous, fine, as long as it's not incongruent to with the people involved. Because if one partner, they're with another person, but one wants to be polyamorous, the other not, and they go along with it, it's going to be incongruent because that's not their thing. If to them, yeah, this is like a three having to do this, it's not their thing. It's, it's an accident waiting to happen. And the same goes for every category of life. Um, if you're living in a household and you want to be vegan and your partner loves bloody rare steaks or whatever, I, I don't even know why people would eat those things. Not because I'm judging you for it. I'm just saying I never, I never imagined myself. I never said to myself, God, I got to get myself a bloody steak. I, I don't know why people would enjoy that personally. But let's say that that were the case because I'm also not hyper vegan either. So you have those two extremes. Um, even if you tolerated it, even if you said, okay, well, honey, I'm going to prepare your dinner now. You don't mind. I'm going to put my hair in a net. I'm putting on like, you know, all this gas mask kinds of things and big gloves, you know, to prepare your steak because I'm vegan and I think it's disgusting. Um, trust me, that energy's carrying over every time I kiss you. There's a part of me, even if subconsciously. Give me a kiss, you meat-eating slob, you know, that doesn't like that about you. And it's going to bleed into, no pun intended, you know, um, it's going to bleed into our relationship energetically. And, the, you know, the vegan resenting the meat-eater, the meat-eater, you know, resenting the other. The metaphysical person who's married to the traditional Jew, the traditional Catholic, the tradu traditional whatever a new ager? I mean, that's unacceptable to some of those people. And, uh, you know, it'll be a, a tension that's building unless there's communication, there's love, there's acceptance, there's expansive. If you're having an expansiveness, to me, as long as there's growth and progress, it's a sign that we're going in the right direction. Even if it's slow, as long as I'm okay with slow progress, this relationship might still be worth, I will stay. If progress stops, why would you stay? Now, the last thing I'm saying, would you tell anybody you love? Would you tell your own child, hey, mom, you know, I'm in this partnership. It's, it's you know, now that I'm 18, I got this thing going on and we're going to maybe get married in a year or two. That's great, honey. What, tell me about the relationship. Well, completely stagnant, no growth, but I'm just hoping someday they'll get over this addiction that they have for such and such such and such, or um, I'm hoping that they'll loosen up a little on their beliefs because they really judge me a lot for mine. Oh, that sounds just stellar. I could just see myself going, well, honey, great. Um, no, I really wouldn't. I'd go, okay, wait, doesn't that sound strange? You're getting in, it's already a mess of some kind. A, a, a flags are up, you know, don't do it. And yet you're stepping in. Well, because I'm thinking they might... Why don't you date until the day they change? Or you meet somebody that's already the change you're looking for. 
Why would you step in fully to something that's, you know, already bothering you or upsetting you, especially if the signs are it's contracting or it's stuck? Why would that be okay? If I'm a chiropractor, would I say, hey, listen, I'm feeling there's a subluxation of the seventh cervical. Let's just leave that alone. You know, why, why would I do that? Why would I do massage and say, oh, you have, you know, trigger point here and there that's locked up, trapezius and you know, latissimus dorsi and so on. But, but it'd be interesting to see what happens if we just leave it like that. That makes no sense. The surgeon, you know what? When we had you open, I saw something that shouldn't be there. I just thought it'd be interesting, you know, to leave it so we could look at it in x-rays. I thought it'd be really cool. It's probably left from a surgery 18 years ago. And I was just curious to look at it in x-rays. Like, hey, look, pictures. Put them on YouTube, you know. It doesn't make any sense to be okay with stuff like that. It doesn't make any sense at all. So be the change you'd like to see in the world, but also in your life. And it's also okay to ask for what you need. Ask for what you're loving, what you're looking for. Because what you're really saying is, this is what I'm about. If I say, I just want you to change because I don't like you or something about you, that's a little off. But when I say, look, you can be that way. Here's what I'm about. And that's what you're about. Can these in any way come closer together? When one person says no, that tells me something. So you want me to come from way over here and deal with you way over here, completely different. You know, I think the better decision would be you should find somebody that's that way and I'll find somebody who's this way and let's both be happy. I think that's granting each other a sense of uh, reprieve and goodbye and, and release and freedom. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. So thank you guys for joining us. God bless you all and thank you for your time and I, I pray you all well and hope to see you soon. Peace, bye-bye.